welcome to Shamble Stay at Home Festival. Hello, Josie. How are you? Hello. I am fine. I have managed to sprain my ankle while running, which, which felt like a cosmic punishment I did not deserve. Um, but apart from that, yeah, I'm absolutely fine. That's my show and tell is my stupid raised foot. <laughs> um, how are you, Robin? I'm good. I've done my exercises this morning, and I've. So, I didn't know I've been doing. It's a thank bit you. Salt the, on the wound there. Yeah. The uh, they're uh, only very old men's exercise. So I use the Angela Lansbury uh, shape up and dance <laughs> tape. It's the only thing I can push myself to. And uh, but I, I've really been enjoying. It. Can I say thank you to everyone who's uh, keeping all the school work going, and all of the teachers, and all of the people, and and the, and the people working uh, in in colleges and all of these places. Because uh, you know, every morning get up and. Uh, and my son started doing his homework. And I did not know. Today it's the Black Death. I didn't know. So there's a bubonic plague, a pneumonic plague, and there's a third plague as well. So bubo skin uh, and glands, I think. Uh, pneumonic is is the lungs. But I don't know what the third plague is. So if anyone knows, uh, tell us what the third plague is, because that will help with uh, today's homework. Uh, I've really found got- these nursery have been sending little videos every day. And what's really funny is there are songs that they only sing at nursery that I didn't realise. And... Um, she, uh, she'd been singing all these sort of songs. I'd be like, what is that? What, what is this? And then suddenly seeing these videos, I was like, oh, this explains the last three months of my life. But they've been wonderful, yeah. Oh, yeah, because you, oh, yeah, yeah. you haven't yet. Because the other day we were talking about monkey, monkey music, monkey, <laughs> monkey music, monkey, monkey music, time. Do, 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 do. And you didn't know anything about that, did you? You looked at me as if I was a, a fool, which is your normal look, obviously, at me. I look at you in absolute awe. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we do the uh, show and tell? Have you got something today for show? And- oh, that's it. You've done it, haven't you? Yeah. You've shown your injury. Um, yeah. Show and tell today is uh, connected to something that we did a couple of years ago at the Wimbledon Theatre, uh, which you will remember about. Remember about um, two years ago, Josie and I and, and Grace Petrie and Billy Bragg and Charlotte Church and Alexis James A. Caster, loads, loads of people got together to try and make some money for uh, Barry Crimmins. I'll just go out of shot. Um, but uh, Barry Barry Crimmins, a uh, great uh, American comedian, really important. This is his book there, Never Shake Hands with a War Criminal, uh, won the Mark Twain Prize and various other things. And uh, his wife, Helen, was very uh, ill at the time. And because they're based in America, health uh, costs were, were absolutely enormous. So we did, did a benefit. And... Um, then at Edinburgh that year, we did a show just kind of in memory of, of, of Barry, because unfortunately, then at the beginning of, of that year, Barry died. And Helen gave me this is my show and tell. It's such a lovely thing. And uh, this is uh, she gave me. I don't know. You probably won't really be able to see this. But uh, while we were there, uh, this is a letter from Howard Zinn, a great historian and an activist who, who wrote this book here and many other books. You can't be neutral on a moving train, which is also a, a, a documentary you can see. And it's just his letter of recommendation for Barry Crimmins. Barry Crimmins is hilariously funny, but more important, his humour comes out of a deep intelligence, an extraordinary understanding of the world around him and an intense commitment to social justice. Howard Zinn. There we go. Wow. And underneath it, he's just written, Dear Barry, I hope this is the kind of statement that will be useful to you. You can edit it as you like, Howard. And uh, it's just such a, a lovely thing for her to give me. And I, I just wanted to mention that um, H- Helen's health has, has remained up and down. And uh, if any of you can go, there, there's a, we'll put it up on, on the site, but go and look at Helen Crimmins' work. Helen is also a, a great photographer, really wonderful photographs. And uh, go and look at her site. I think it's just HelenCrimmins.com, if, I, if I've got that wrong anyway. So Trent will put that up. And uh, find out about her work and uh, donate to her if you can and buy her stuff uh, because she could really do uh, with the help. So I wanted to mention that as well because yesterday after the applause uh, for the National Health Service, there are many reasons uh, – to love it and to support those people and to find out what is going yeah the way that you can support people and one of those stories that tells how important it is is the story of helen and uh, and berry and th- their battle in a country which doesn't have a national health service so that is my show and tell for the day that's true it was a great fight wasn't it such yeah, a lovely it was a great, a great night what was exciting was we were we were on uh, skype or facetime with them and they were at the side of the stage weren't they so you yeah. could sort of turn around and be like hi 
while you were doing they, it. Which they they were sat cool. on the sofa in Indiana, and every now and again, Billy Bragg would play a song directly down <laughs> into the <laughs> love. Joined today, uh, we have three wonderful guests. We have uh, Miles Hunt, we have Les Dennis, and we have, first of all, uh, Stephen Merchant. So, hello, good morning. Merchant. Hello. So, hello, Hi. good morning, Stephen hello. Merchant. Hi, guys. All right, how are hey. you? <clears throat> yeah, good. Fine. Now, you... Uh, the last time we'll start straight off with a show and tell with you because the last time we had you on, uh, the, I mean, years and years ago, it was a different kind of podcast then. Um, your See? show, uh, condiments, wasn't it? It was some saucy condiments, thank you. Yeah, it was some saucy condiments, thank you. Yes, it was uh, something I'd picked up on my travels. I think I was in uh, where was I? I was in um, somewhere in Europe, and I think it was um, Amsterdam, I wasn't it? Was it Amsterdam? That sounds right. Yes, and uh, yes, there was a there was a set of uh, sort of novelty um, salt and pepper shakers, um, both shaped like penises, um, but they were also sort of emblazoned with you know with windmills and other kind of oh lovely, yes. very um, tasteful. <laughs> it was classy, and it was it's the perfect memento, you know, <laughs> um, because it, it sort of you know it combined its wonderful you know um, heritage and also um, giant penises. Um, which is something I associate with Amsterdam. But I, at this time, I, I'm actually torn because I, I was thinking of going one way with my show and tell, but now that you've just shared a letter, I thought maybe I'd, show, I'd share you a letter I have framed in my office. Um, I, 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 know, I don't know if you're trying to avoid foul language, and this is mild bad language, but this is an actual email that was sent. I used to do a radio show on BBC Six Music, and for a while there was a TV commercial which had people kind of looking bored and idle at the weekend, lots of shots of different people, the kind of stage. And then it would sort of, if you need something to do on a Sunday, what it Anyway, so this was a, an email that was sent to us, uh, which I've had subsequently framed. Um, and I'm not making any of this up. And, and when I when I raise my voice, that's uh, because it's, those, those sections are in bold on the email. Hello, I am writing about the trailer, or shall we say commercial, in between programmes for Stephen Merchant's 3pm show on Six Music, the BBC radio commercial on TV, the one showing bored people. It shows them doing things like playing with peas, etc. It shows one of them with chopsticks taking a piece of dirt that accumulates in your stomach and picking it with the chopsticks. I thought that this was disgusting, filthy and revolting. It just shows what a total piece of shit people like you are and what complete <laughs> pieces of shit work at BBC Radio. Whoever produced that is not even worth a piece of shit. People are trying <laughs> and relax. What an uneducated little shit get lost you little piece of slime, you worthless crap. I hope you rot in alcohol and drug abuse. Rot in binge drinking. Just <laughs> rot in binge drinking. Um, which is a particularly interesting way of sort of damning you isn't it because i always associate binge drinking with sort of like a fun boozy weekend yeah. <laughs> it's the idea that you sort of i've had a Rot. weekend but then died um is it signed off quite often those are signed off in a formal cheery way like as ever yours faithfully <laughs> yeah but uh, I, I, mean, I don't think anyone's set out to cause offense but um, mm. um yeah so anyway my, my while i'm um, in lockdown I find that I may indeed rot in binge drinking. <laughs> There's very little else to do. <laughs> that, that that reminded me of. I remember years ago, again, very early on, before before the office, probably. Uh, and uh, uh, and and Ricky would had to do some little kind of weird interstitial adverts uh, for Radio One. I think about um, revision, something like mm -hmm. that. And mm. I remember there was one with you and Ricky, and it, it was on the Chris Moyles show. And afterwards, Chris Moyles came straight back and he went, uh, two words for that, hail and pace. So I don't know whatever happened to you two. But, I know, uh, I know. <laughs> Can I, I say that... I galled by that, by being uh, what I... Moyles. Moyles. Well, he absolutely... Oh, hang on. What have you got me a cup of tea? Um... Oh. <laughs> this is real, isn't it, Steve? You see, it is. we are keeping it real here. Um, I like, wanted really... to say about the the, the time when uh, you and Robin and Ricky and Jimmy Carr did a show in Edinburgh. Which, what year was that? Was that two thousand and one? 
Or was it yeah, later? It, it was the year that the, the office um, was out. So was that 2001 or 2000? That's right, 2001. Yes, yeah. that's, that's right, 2001. Yes, yeah. 2001. Yeah. I remember that show so well. So, and I remember your set in it, Stephen. I will, like, always cherish as one of my favourite stand-up performances I've ever seen. Just in terms of um, the, the sheer, like, you, you came on in this absolute already state of, like, a peak mock frustration at the crowd and then you just sort of created this atmosphere where you were hectoring them about like very specific local news articles that you had or hadn't appeared in and getting them to join in with your with your um, catchphrases and things like that um do you ever like have you performed much on stage since then would you do it again please i like i loved it and i'll never forget, never forget it. it the the joke of that act was that um this was before I'd ever done any TV stuff or anything, so no one knew who I was. And the joke was me as a sort of angry and entitled comedian from the West Country who would try, whenever I did gigs, I was immediately frustrated that other people hadn't heard of me. I didn't think <laughs> it was getting the level of respect I deserved. And yeah. uh, I, as, as you say, I would kind of read out, you know, mock newspaper articles, which appeared to be glowing reviews, but actually I'd written them in such a way that they were actually damning reviews. Yeah, yeah. You know, misinterpreted. And... Um, it would end with me sort of ranting at the audience and then the most fun I would have is I would storm off into the wings, just let the stage go quiet, just leave the microphone standing on the stage and then after a beat come back in and just sort of embarrassingly walk back to the mic and go, you can't get out that way. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so much fun and when it went well, as it did in Edinburgh, it was the most fun I'd ever had on stage. It was such a thrill. People got the joke, they understood I was sort of but uh, I was making fun of, you know, sort of that sort of entitled comedian. But when I did it elsewhere, outside of Edinburgh, where sometimes people just thought I was that person, <laughs> I never bombed as atrociously because you just, I had nowhere to go because I didn't have an act. <laughs> so like if that, if that wasn't working, it wasn't like I could go into my proper routine. And I just, I mean, I, I remember in Exeter once, just silence. The only person <laughs> laughing was the waitress was very sweetly... <laughs> Uh, had seen a little comedy and got the joke, and everyone else just deathly silence. And you know, you <laughs> struggle through your 20 minutes, and it's just getting worse and worse. And, uh, <laughs> someone actually shouted taxi for the comedian, which I thought was just a sort of myth. Um, and uh, and I remember phoning my agent, like, I'm never going to gig again. I cannot. This is this was this was just the worst. And I thought I thought it was because I was from Bristol and I was playing in Exeter. And I felt like it, I wasn't far enough away from Bristol, maybe, for the joke to work. <laughs> and then I went down to Cornwall and did a gig there, and it went great. So maybe that is right. Like, the closer I am to Bristol, my, it's like my kryptonite, my superpowers go. But um, mm -hmm. I tried to do that act once I'd become well-known, and people just, why are you being so mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you found a, a great way of doing that, because, I mean, one thing I found that when it did work, and I only ever it saw it badly, badly, was you were impossible to follow, because you it basically was this example of someone, you know, showing the vile, festering ego of stand-up comics. So you would reveal <laughs> this on stage, and then a comic would go, hey, everyone, how are you doing? And they think, I can see your festering ego. The man before <laughs> you has revealed the ugly truth of this entire profession. But well, you it's did a bit it was funny because when I did, I did so when I did, I did subsequently go back to stand up, Josie, some years later, having been on TV, and and I just I realized I had to sort of start from scratch in a way because I had that act, but I couldn't do it anymore; it didn't work. And it was a bit like when you know Tiger Woods uh, redesigned his golf swing. I had to. I mean, I'm comparing myself with Tiger Woods, the greatest golfer. <laughs> but um, I had to sort of redesign my act and kind of almost learn from scratch again. And fine, because that, that act also was, it had a shelf life of about 20 minutes. Yeah. And then after that, people just got weary of it. So, yeah, it was hard. It was funny. You know, it, it worked very well. And then I sort of, I'd worked myself into a corner and I had to sort of unlearn all of that again. And would you go back to life now? Well, now, now well, in a couple of months. Well, in, well, indeed, I keep meaning to. I just, I just find it very exhausting. I just, you know, going out at night and working up little, you know, material in clubs and pubs and just... You know, I'm slightly anxious all day, and then I don't know. I, I just, I mean, I'd like to. I just find it really time consuming, and mm. it's very really antisocial. You're out, it's sort of, you know, when everyone else is out or having dinner or watching a movie, you're waiting in the wings of a pub somewhere. It's just, oh, it's, I find it brutal. I find it how. <laughs> but it was, it was an interesting way that you changed because you still 
in in the later gigs when you have become well known, you still did that wonderful egotistical kind of thing where you know all of those great pictures from the press where you are going to an and award uh, so they can also get the producer Asher Teller in shot. Your head is almost always cut out, so you just became a, a, a body, uh, yeah. which was you know a producer Asher Teller, Ricky Gervais, and the body of Steve Merchant are caught in this shot. That's right, it but it's so shot. That's right, it's but it's funny because even though I, I think keep elements of that, but I had to I had to temper it because I found what I, when I went back to stand up, I realised that um, you know if, if someone kind of heckled or was rude, I think my default was to be was to lash out and be quite aggressive in in a comeback, and I and I realised people didn't like that. I think maybe they <laughs> saw me as quite a, a friendly avuncular type. And the, when I was suddenly kind of, they were like, oh, we don't like that. So even, <laughs> you know, even in my sort of put downs, I had to be gentler. And it was really, like, as I say, it was like re redesigning the whole thing. You have, well, what, I was go, just going to say, go I was, go, you, go, have go, a, you, you have what I get told I have, which is a voice that sounds as if you're always smiling. And oh, so you can't then turn around and be like, because oh, people are like, but, but he was smiling the whole time. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> I was going to ask about, uh, because our next guest is a fan of a film that I'm a fan of as well, uh, which is, I, I thought, uh, Fighting With My Family, uh, the movie that you uh, you wrote and directed, is, is a fantastic uh, film and really worth, if, if any of you are thinking, what am I going to watch uh, tonight uh, or this afternoon or this morning? It's available any time of day. It's really good to watch. It's one of those films. It doesn't matter what time it is. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a beautifully made film. And a few people have sent in questions saying, were you always interested in, in, in wrestling or was it just the story when when you actually saw the real life story of that family was that what got you into it that was the only thing that intrigued me. that was the only thing that intrigued me i had no knowledge of wrestling before that film i did not understand it i didn't understand why it was appealing why it was fun why people watched it i had the same kind of snobbish attitude that i think a lot of people do about it i saw this documentary and even that i was kind of slightly reluctant to watch but um, it was it was sent to me it was a documentary that was on channel 4 about this family of wrestlers and it was sent to me by Dwayne The Rock Johnson, my dear friend. Um, we <laughs> put together in a movie called uh, Tooth Fairy. You're welcome. And um, we, he had, which I always thought was interesting, he had watched it um, whilst he was, he, was in, he was in England making a film and he, he was in his hotel room and he was watching Channel 4. And so I just find such a funny idea that The Rock is sat, <laughs> you know, in like a travel lodge somewhere and he finished the short bread and he's wearing his very tiny room. His very tiny is, uh, is Dwayne Johnson. And, um, he's, you know, he never misses grand designs. He's watched that. And then on comes this documentary <laughs> about um, his wrestling family. And it was really, it was such a sweet story. It's such a beautiful story. Just, and, and once I started hanging out with the real family and going to wrestling matches, that's when I realized what was entertaining about it, why it was fun. It's like Panta, which I'd never realized. It's like a weird theater kind of performance, art, comedy, fun show. It's a really weird mix of, things and i sort of fell in love with it after that have you ever seen that in championship wrestling uh, based in glasgow i don't think Wait. so that already sounds terrifying it's the well no well no it's it, the best it's the best because it's uh, very very specific to glasgow in up. terms of who the heels are and why and who the um who the heroes are it's it's so fantastic it's it's the best you I can't wait for you to um, discover to it. Discover I, it. I, it's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Well, I had, I had th things you mentioned things like heels and you know that's the kind of bad guys in wrestling and it's I I mean I had to kind of immerse myself in all of that jargon and there's all this there's almost a bit like the magic circle there's this weird kind of unspoken code about how much they give away of what's real and what's not and and so you sort of have to win their trust slowly and they start to share the kind of mechanics of wrestling um, and it's uh, it's really so, but I would hope, I mean, maybe, I don't know if you were a fan of wrestling, uh, Robin, I imagine you were, but uh, I think the film works even if you don't like wrestling and have no interest in it. It does. I mean, I, I was interested in it. I actually wrote a film about wrestling with my friend Darren Ashton, and uh, we spent 10 years just rewriting it and rewriting it. And the great thing about when your film came out was when, well, we can stop now. That's that done then. So thank you very much. You've saved us from a lot of wasted time. Now, one of the fun things about doing this is the, the neighbourly sense of it. And hopefully in the background during the last bit, you could hear Miles Hunt uh, telling his dog to be quiet <laughs> in this wonderful street that we've created. Uh, this is some version of Stella Street, I, I, like, I like to think. Um, and uh, so our, our next guest, and we'll be back with you, Steve, uh, shortly, is someone who, yeah, I, I think I first saw live in 
in in in 1990, 89, 1990, uh, the Hup tour. Uh, since then, uh, as well as with the Wonder Stuff, uh, his solo work, uh, work and uh, uh, Vent 414 and lots of other things, is uh, Miles Hunt and his show and tell is his dog. His dog. Hello, it Miles. Is. This is young Winky. Hello. He's, um, he's obviously named after Winky, the winning dog. Sorry, spoiler alert there. In the movie, go on, mate. Uh, um, in the movie Best in Show, um, the winning dog in that uh, in that the dog show uh, of that that movie's based around is a the Norwich Terrier, and called Winky. And there's an amazing that the, the owners of of do you know the film? You, you know what I'm on about? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the song about the little dog called Winky, and they rhyme. Terrier with Deria, which uh, is fantastic. And when I got Young Winky, Eric and named him, uh, my partner in the Wonder Stuff, uh, Eric and named him Winky, which of course doesn't sound good if I'm in a dog park and shout, Winky! I, I would have much preferred to have called him Hank, which would sound far more manly uh, when trying to get him to come back to me. But yeah, he is, uh, he's my lock in pal. Um, it, life hasn't really changed um, for me during the lockdown. I, I, I live on my own with the Winkster uh, in the middle of nowhere. I go days on end without seeing or speaking to anyone anyway. It's been like that for years. So, uh, yeah, not, not much change here. But I was impressed by, I looked at your Facebook the other day, and you had a very day. You'd done all the windows. <laughs> You'd done everything. <laughs> That's what I, I did. <laughs> yeah, it started with, I was looking out the window at my van. At my van. And then I was going to come inside and done the inside of the windows. I'm looking around the house. I'm now in absolute go mood. And uh, I clean the oven. I clean the splashback uh, behind the hob. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was quite the day. And then yesterday I was thinking, all right, what else can I do? Uh, and then the postman turned up with John Niven's uh, new book, the F-U-C-K um, list. And uh, I sat down. Um, on the sofa, read uh, 120 pages of that and fell asleep and then just woke up and ate chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the, um, well, I, I was going to ask you about your diaries because, diaries because you, 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 you published you two like volumes. first volume of, of the one... Oh, three! I'm sorry. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm behind then. I've only got two. Uh, good. That, there's my purchase for the day sorted then. But the, <laughs> the first volume is kind of the wonder stuff or everything building up. And then I remember when we did the uh, the Burko Fest, Burkhamsted Festival, you were just yeah. doing the second one. And mm -hmm. you said, oh, my God, I've returned to these diaries of you on tour in Japan doing incredible things. And you went, I cannot believe the human being that I was. And, mm. and you said you had real trouble meeting your younger self and going, why aren't you enjoying this? Uh, <laughs> well, I, yeah, it's th thoroughly, I, yeah. Th thoroughly, thoroughly dislikable bloke in my diaries. Um, it's why the human condition. <laughs> yeah, well... Sending me around the world with my mates uh, for people to applaud us and treat us wonderfully. And every night I would go back to my hotel room or board, board afternoons in hotel rooms and dressing rooms and just write this vitriol in, <laughs> into these diaries, how much I was hating it all at the time. Um, so I locked them away. Um, and then came up with the idea probably six, seven years ago now that maybe it's time to read those diaries and see if there's a book in any of them. And uh, I was I was actually delighted that I did. I no longer feel like the guy that wrote those those diaries because it then gave me the opportunity to argue with him uh, from my sort of contemporary point, which I think is actually without blowing my own trumpet is, is the strength of the books. Is that I, I have little attacks at myself, my former self. And, uh, and it made me, yeah, um, it, it, I, I didn't expect the experience to be cathartic. Um, you know, we're, we're a rock and roll band. There, there are deaths involved, um, um, as, you might, as you might in that world. And, um, yeah, I, I came out of writing the three books of feeling like a, a, a better person. <laughs> Uh, certainly better than the guy that wrote the diaries anyway. Yeah, it's like a lovely long version of the big issue every week has that letter oh, to my young... And also, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just 
quickly mention to everyone as well that, of course, at the moment, big issue sellers, uh, this is like an, an impossible time uh, for them. And you can go and subscribe to the big issue. If you subscribe to the big issue, you can subscribe for, for three months, six months, whatever. It means that uh, big issue sellers can, uh, you know, they, they will get money. So just quickly mention that. That's really cool. I didn't know about uh, that. Yeah, you can just subscribe. Just go to the big issue page and uh, and do that. Uh, you have a new album. Well, your album's been out for a few months now. Actually, was it the autumn the album came out? I'm trying to think when the when the last one uh, was out. It came out in November. Came out in November, I think. November, yeah, I think. yeah or, or late October. Yeah. And where's the best place for people uh, to go in that, at uh, the moment? If you go to, or well, if you want a physical copy, um, you go to the wonderstuff.co.uk. There, UK, there is a link to our online shop. Or it is streamable in the usual places. Thank you. Are you go? We have. Uh, are you going to uh, play us a song, Miles? <laughs> I've never really worked way there. This is great. <laughs> by the way, this morning I've never mentioned it, Miles. I was, gonna, and I just got a message from him going, "Oh, thanks for mentioning about doing a song at this god awful hour." So <laughs> this is uh, welcome to the god awful Miles Hunt sessions. As, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I've always maintained that that nothing, that good. nothing good has ever come of uh, uh, any musical performance before midday. You know, no great rock and roll record got recorded before midday, I promise you. So, uh, yeah, this isn't the easiest task that you've asked me to uh, perform. <laughs> so is it now? You want me to do it now? If that's OK, yeah. Or we can come back. If you want, want we can come back and do it, whatever. Just, I'll just quickly mention what Miles is setting up. I hope you're enjoying uh, this morning. Uh, obviously, we have different kind of sometimes the technology works tremendously well and sometimes there's a little kind of uh, glitch in it. Uh, one of the things that we're doing with this is uh, we're also there's a tip jar at the bottom and we're trying to collect money to help some of the artists and performers who are going to be up against it because even when this period is over pretty much all live gigs have been cancelled for at least the next uh, three months so we're setting up a fund to help any of those people who really kind of hit the wall and also to help some of the smaller um, art centres and stuff that may well go under uh, if we aren't able to, to give them some money to keep them running while they can't put on shows uh, so if yeah. you do get a chance um, that would be great. Sorry, I didn't mean not to get to join in with that. My daughter was um, asking me for a banana biscuit, so it really, biscuit. so it really is all go around here. But yeah, it's it's really helpful if anyone has even just a little tiny amount of money to pop in the tip jar. And uh, we don't biscuit. Thank you, Josie. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, with uh, please remember, this is a god awful rendition of a song that sounds, sounds much, better, much off, better after midday. Miles Hunt. to what you you were just asking about you know considering people in need in uh, in the music business and beyond and uh, it's your money i'm after baby <laughs> Give me love on no none of that stuff because it's your money i'm after baby your love and your kisses they're just not enough it's just your money i'm after baby well, I know that it's hard and I know that it's tough When each thing you give him is just not enough Forget your heart, it's your bank, I wanna break It's just your money I'm at the baby Heaven's above all, no, I'm not in love It's just your Money, I'm at the baby. I think I've sang the same verse into here. Yeah, whatever. It's love and your kisses are just not enough. It's your money, I'm at the baby. Well, I know that it's hard and I know that it's tough. When each thing you give him is just not enough. Forget your heart, it's your bank. I wanna break. It's just your money, I'm at the baby. Yeah. With myself and nobody else, I'm in love with myself. I'm in love with myself and nobody else, I'm in love with myself. Ah. Give me a love, I'll know none of that stuff, cause it's your money, I'm at the baby. Your love and your kisses, they're just not enough. It's your money, I'm at the baby. Well, I know that it's hard and I know that it's tough. When each thing you give them is just not enough. 
Forget your heart at your bank. Don't want to break it's just your money. I'm after bank. Thank you very much, my son. I hope I that I will see you at the uh, at the Mosley uh, Folk Festival. I hope that's still going to be uh, uh, happening. Yeah, that would be nice. So with luck, uh, that that's all. That that's at the end of the August. Hopefully, things will be up and going again then. And uh, there's lots of brilliant things there. Thank you very much, Miles. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Lovely to see you all virtually. And uh, I'm going to go and sit somewhere comfortable and watch the rest of it. So we'll Thank just you. like to keep your mic on so we can hear you shouting at the dog. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> we like it. Can I just yeah. say something, Robin, before Miles goes? Okay. Yeah. Um, I I have to thank you, Miles, because uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I um. For many years, when I was in my teens, I ran a mobile disco. <laughs> I ran a mobile disco. Uh, I played. Um, uh, I ruined several weddings. Um, I did a scout jamboree once, which uh, where the arcade told me to uh, switch off "Smells Like Teen Spirit" because the kids were going crazy. Um, I did a couple of student unions, and I have to say, some some absolute guaranteed floor fitters were always size of a cow or, or dizzy. Oh. Aww. Always, always stuck them on absolute bangers. Took the roof off. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you say you've dug me out of many a hole. <laughs> also, I should say. So I should say. Uh, Natalie Haynes, who was uh, on yesterday's show, uh, she wanted me to tell you that uh, she was she was brought up in Birmingham, and from the age of sixteen, she was a huge fan. And when she saw you at the Larn weekend, where she was performing as well, she was uh-huh. too and say uh-huh. thank you for all of that. So that is to pass on now. That uh, and that's another lovely uh-huh. thing that's not happening. The Larn weekend. So hello mm. to anyone who's watching this who would have been at the Larn weekend. Um, yeah. Thank you again, Miles. You're very welcome. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of it. Cheers. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to his chair in his room because that's we're not going on today. Let's get it. Let's get it. It's a great show. Oh, how, are you, how are you, Les? Are you all right? I'm very good, thank you. I'm I'm really well. Yeah. We have some so many questions for you. One, one of the one the ones I didn't know about is this um, graffiti in Norwich. Do you know about this? That, so you, I do know about this. This, yeah, basically, um, it was about a year ago. I kept seeing on social media, media, um, photos of um, Les Dennis randomly painted across buildings in Norwich. And at first, I thought it had just been Photoshop. And then it turned <laughs> out that somebody is going around doing it. And I, I did the the shaggy thing, and I put it wasn't me <laughs> on social media, and it kind of went viral. And then people were kind of talking about. Les Dennis going around himself, um, painting his name all over all over Norwich, and it, it got on to "Have I got news for you?" <laughs> and, then, and, then the, and then apparently in another city, um, Bobby Davra was written <laughs> all over the buildings, kind of post impressionist, I suppose. You're either a Les Dennis or a Bobby Davra city, and you've got to be very clear <laughs> about that. Have you thought that weird. this is actually actually the perfect time to start? painting your name on yeah. walls because <laughs> they'll never suspect this is a perfect no, time no absolutely it's <laughs> funny you know like how things can just evolve a week a guy put on social media he said that um i saw les dennis in, in, in a um some kind of weird pub i can't remember the name of it <laughs> um, and he was um he was rude to everybody and he um shouted at my two-year-old child so i just posted back um, no, you didn't. I've been in all day, um, and and I'm I'm still at home. Don't tell lies. And then suddenly, everybody started post- posting this. I met Les Dennis, and <laughs> me doing outrageous things. Usually, <laughs> you know, stealing toilet rolls from supermarkets and 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 swearing at people. The the inventiveness of it was just hysterical, and it was hashtag disappointed. And it just went. It was mad. You know, you suddenly you, you think you're just kind of answering somebody, you know, a, a troll to just say don't do that. And suddenly, um, people got behind it. It was it was weird. I love that. I love that kind of things. Like you know, uh, they go just saw Les Dennis shoving a child into a bucket of tulips outside into Flora. You know, there's just these beautiful images. (laughs) In a thousand years, you're going to be this folk hero. People are going to look back and be like, "Well, this Les Dennis did a lot of things." (laughs) Well, that Les basically the Les Dennis that was the invention, the reinvention. 
but of Stephen and, and Ricky, because, you know, that kind of, um, when they asked me to play a twisted and demented version of myself, that's when I kind of got a reinvention. And, and I, have thank, I have to thank you for that, Stephen, and, and for Ricky as well. well. Well, no, we have to thank you for jumping into it with two feet first, because, I mean, you did not, I don't think you bolt to any of the nonsense we made you say. You just, I mean, we had you stripping naked, Les, if you recall. I'm sure, you got, I'm sure it's burnt into your memory. Uh, certainly brilliant to mine, but um, it was so <laughs> it was so funny. You were so good. Oh, and people, well. I think, had, had sort of underestimated how great an actor you are as well. And you're such a you're such a fine actor. And it was so funny because I remember um, I posted a thing for a while back on on um, Instagram because do you recall that scene we had you do where you're sort of phoning Heat magazine to say uh, Les yep. Dennis was spotted sending spending a shit ton of money. Well, <laughs> uh, it's suddenly because they released that 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 uh, recording of Donald Trump back in the sort of nineties where he's masquerading as his own publicist, <laughs> and, uh, New, New York newspapers, and sort of saying, you know, uh, yeah, I'm I forget the name, but he's concocts of a, a persona, but it's clearly Trump phoning up newspapers to give kind of gossip about, you know, the women that is, he's recently slept with and, um, and what a great guy he is. And it just it was uncanny how much oh. it was like what, we had, what we'd created for you. Well, thank this you very much. Tell. is linked to, um, to that. And also, um, you talked about your, um, Robin, your show and tell being linked to Wimbledon because um, when we were about to move house a couple of um, days ago, but clearly we can't. So um, I've been going through all the stuff that we were moving over to the house and uh, this was was there. Um, oh, it is. It is um, when when you appear on Radio Times on the front cover, they send you a copy of that cover, um, and then you get invited to the Radio Times um, awards presentation, which is a really glitzy. Oh, look. <laughs> oh, Snap. Robin, get yours. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> But you're actually not in it, Stephen. You're mentioned in it, but but um, everybody. I'm, I'm the only one there. I don't know. No, <laughs> it's basically, full of all these A-listers uh, and and me and and um, it's it, it was a, it was a joy to be part of that. And funnily enough, the, the the party that they then had was the first showbiz event I took my wife, then my fiance Claire to. She was like, "Is this what it's always like?" Because there was David Attenborough. There was Bob Geld after the there were all these, I mean, massive stars in this room, and she was kind of daunted by it. And uh, um, uh, yeah, and, and now it's now it's um, me, her, and Bobby Davra. <laughs> that's, that's such a uh, the, the David Attenborough thing is. Uh, I've just found, by the way, weirdly enough, there we are. This is off a teddy bear I was given. It's the signature of David Attenborough. It's the best I can do. Um, wow. I, I interviewed him a, a few years ago, and it was the most terrifying thing. Even though he is not terrifying, because right. he carries with him, so, you know what he has created is so beautiful and important, and the the television programs that he, uh, you know, that he commissioned when he was head of BBC Two. And um, did you find that he is the one? I would say of all the people when he is in a yes. room, there's a. It's David Attenborough. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Well, I, in that moment when I did have a little chat with him, I thought I've got to link. I've got to talk to him about something. W- Oh, and I thought, we, we've got this in common. I said, um, I've been working in Bristol recently and they've been sending the driver that, that is usually your driver for me. And he went, oh, yes, what's his name? And I was going, um, oh, I can't remember. <laughs> so we both had a senior moment where we just couldn't remember the name of this driver who took us both around uh, uh, to, to the studio. And he walked away after that. And I thought, I just wasted my time having a senior moment with David Attenborough. But I love him. He's walking away, and he's going, "Oh yeah," and that makes up that they share my driver. <laughs> Just have a moment with me, King yeah. Day. Oh, I what did a like. recording for a day with Tim, Ber- day with Tim Berners Lee, and I wasted so much of our time together where we both had a chat about yoga versus Pilates. And I was like, <laughs> this is not the question to ask <laughs> Tim Berners Lee, but we were just kind of killing time over this day shooting something. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, I look back in the same way, like, great. Now I know how he feels about yoga versus Pilates. I, I think I told you a friend of mine, um, uh, my friend Dan was, was really a big fan Queen and of- uh, he wanted so much to meet Brian May this time that we were, uh, when we were in Chicago, he came to the show. 
and I, I just said, um, Brian, this is Dan. And, and Dan said, oh, uh, it's lovely to meet you. I'm such a big Queen flan. Yeah. <laughs> Still my favourite in terms of this is not the way to start. I think I told you about it was uh, my friend Martin White, musician, accordionist. And uh, he's a huge fan of Martin Amis. And we ended up at a train station together after the Hay Festival. And Martin's opening line to Martin Amis was, my name's Martin too. And the fact that does impress Martin Amis. I've got loads of questions for you. Uh, this is for you and Steve. Last time I saw Steve was in January doing the, uh, the Slapstick Festival where we were talking about Laurel and Hardy. And uh, Leanne would like to know, uh, that she's only so far seen the Laurel and the Hardy movie uh, with Steve Coogan, uh, which she loved. Where should she start in terms of now watching the original Laurel and Hardy movie? So, Steve, I'll start with you and then come over to you, Les. Start with you and then come over to you, Les. Well, finally, that is a tough one, isn't it? I mean, it seems to me that you may as well start with uh, their Oscar winning The Music Box, uh, where they try to carry a piano up a giant flight of steps. If only because it's sort of, in a way, it's them you know, at their, at their purest. It's the homeopathic Lauren Hardy, you know. It's it's a simple task, well, a relatively simple task, which two idiots cannot complete. <laughs> um, for the life of them. And I think that, you know, it's sort of, it's immaculate in that way, in that regard. Les, yeah, do you I, have a favorite? I would uh, probably go for either Sons of the Desert or Way Out West. In Way Out West, when, when um, they're trying to get the plans off Stan and, and he's just giggling he's, when he's being tickled, it is the most joyous thing and of course um you know son of the desert is is a brilliant film about two guys trying to get away with a scam of not being there oh it's beautiful we showed a clip of that didn't we when we did the slapstick festival uh steve that brilliant bit where stan laurel is eating a piece of wax fruit yes. he won't stop. <laughs> he, even though each time he bites into it he goes Ugh. he continues <laughs> yeah yeah. He just down every time. That's what's so every lovely. time. That's what's so lovely. He knows there's something amiss. He knows it doesn't taste like a real apple, but he's not. He's not going to give up. He started. It's there. the human condition. That's right. That's I, right. I love the moment when the yeah. roof and it's raining, and and Ollie says, "I'm going to tell your wife you've been smoking," and Stan just sits there and like looks fearful and just goes, "Would you?" <laughs> 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 every time I hear that, "Would you?" It just, <laughs> I, I can't not laugh. It's beautiful. Speaking of comedy greats, can I just Speaking apologize, of comedy greats, can I just apologize, Les, because I still have a copy of uh, a Bob Hope biography which he lent me, which I've yet to return. So I apologize. <laughs> no, not at all. Keep it, please. This, this is such a perfect um, forum for this, and <laughs> this is a perfect thing to ask over this show. I had a lovely time. I went, there's a lovely uh, shop, second hand bookshop just near Marlborough Station. And uh, I went looking for a biography the other day. And the man went, I think we might. And he crouched down into this corner. Ooh. And he went, You're probably wondering why I'm crouching down in this corner. But we got some of Dennis Norden's old books from his house. So they <laughs> might be here. And I didn't need another copy of John LeMessurier's autobiography, Jobbing Actor. <laughs> but I did because it was Dennis <laughs> Norden's. And if people think I'm a hoarder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he might have made some interesting margin notes. Mm, marginalia from Norden, yes, please. Um, <laughs> you've got some, have you got some, you, did, I, did you manage to get the questions that I, I that we've got loads of audience questions? Uh, I and, did, and, hang on, let me come back to them. I've been looking through them to see if there's any that I really love. Um, um, uh, well, there, a lot of them are very silly. Oh, so somebody, uh, Nick Gregory, wanted to ask you, Les, uh, about what it was like shooting the club with Rick and Bob. Um, have you got any stories from that? How I really, really enjoyed that. Um, kind of, it, it was before the extras, and it was kind of, um, it was, a, it was, it was the oddest show to do because, again, I was playing myself, but, um, but it was. It was improvised, whereas I had the, the beauty of, of having a script written by Ricky and Stephen with, with that. We kind of literally, I met um, uh, Vic outside the club uh, and we had to go in um, and, and just chat about it, as, you know, just make it up. And I oh, here we go. This is the crash. This, that... this, this place reminds me so much of a club called Capers in South End, which, which really had existed. And he just went, afterwards, when we, we shot it, he went, Capers, I love that. <laughs> just an odd name for a club. I just thought, well, I'm going to use it here. So it was, it was great fun to do. And I, I, I think it's still out there on YouTube somewhere. Yeah, I wasn't aware of it. And I love Vic and Bob's work. I can't believe that there's a 
but I've managed to miss out on. I think Robin's crashed out, so it's my show now. We're going to talk about teen issues. <laughs> I'm 37. Um, I, oh, gosh. Uh, Robin really has crashed out. Let's all talk about him behind his back. <laughs> I'm not qualified to host, oh, qualified to sidekick. Um, I, I, people have asked us a bit more about um, your episode of Extras and particularly when it comes to the fact that uh, Ricky, uh, what's Chris Nicholson said that, how did you guys cope with the fact that Ricky Gervais seemed to be helplessly corpsing for the entire episode? Um, how was that to shoot that episode? What's your memories of it? It was hard for you, Stephen, I think, because you had to sometimes run with him and tell him yeah. off. Well, it was, I mean, it was, it was, I mean, there was non-stop corpsing in that. I mean, particularly when you're nude in a changing room. In a changing room. 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 I mean, that was not impossible to get through. The, yeah. You in the pub sharing your kind of heartfelt emotions with him. I mean, it was, it was, it was monstrous all the way through, just getting it done. It was. I remember the very last scene, you know, where I'm in, in bed with the, the woman that I've met that I've met in the pub, and um, and the the line where I said I don't really know, and then um, when she said what, and I say <laughs> I'll give you the money myself. Ricky was behind the camera with you, and you had to say to him, Ricky, you're gonna go. Ha- you're gonna have to go out the room. Yeah. Oh yeah. I can't have you in the room because he still he laughed through every day. Well, that was your improvised line, if you recall. So I don't think we were expecting it. You know, you're, we just can see your figure in the darkness, seemingly making love to a woman and just saying, if it's up there, I'll give you the money myself. <laughs> I mean, it couldn't be funnier. And um, yeah, it was, it was so funny. Yeah, it's it one of my favourite things we've done. It, it's such a funny episode. That, yeah, I mean, I can't thank you enough for jumping into it because it was, it was joy. You. you know, and it was so much fun with you in Life's Too Short as well. And um Oh, I love that. I loved it when, when, when we did that, that, that Easter special. Yeah, the three of you. It was just wonderfully bittersweet. And um, yeah. it's a shame because we obviously lost Keith Chegman since then, another un- underrated actor. Yeah, totally. He's, he's so brilliant in his extras episode. And then when we did those, those episodes um, uh, with Warwick, uh, that was so deadpan. Uh, when you were discussing Warwick. how you would like to kill yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, that was great fun. So we um, are running out of our little 50-minute streaming block, so I'm, oh. I'm going to wrap up on everyone's behalf. But I just want to say how fun it's been to get to hang out with you guys and have you chat with each other. And if you guys ever wanted to start your own online show, I would absolutely watch it <laughs> on a daily basis. So it's just something to think about for the future. Um, thank you both so much for your time. Thank you. It's been, it's been well, lovely to have company. I you know, really appreciate it. I know, it's very fun, isn't it? Yeah, it is um, And Also, I want to say thanks to Miles Hunt for performing for us at this god-awful hour of the morning. And just again to say, oh, Robin's back! Very oh. Hi, Robin, just in time. I've, it's my show now and you have to play by my rules. Um, I also wanted to just say that we are doing this in part. We have a, a tip uh, jar. If you do have the odd quid, it would be very helpful. But also tonight at I think I'm going to say half past eight. I might be wrong. We have a live comedy gig uh, with John Luke Roberts and me and house band Johnny and the Baptist and Bill Al Zaffar and Shelf. Oh, tomorrow night, of course, is only Friday. <laughs> there we go. It's tomorrow <laughs> night. Who knows anymore? So um, don't you in tonight unless you would like to just sit with your thoughts alone but if you want to tune in tomorrow night at half past eight we have a comedy club please do it was really fun last week and um i expect as the weeks plow on it should become more fun or weird so treat yourself uh, robin how was your time on your own I had a really I... nice time do you know what it's the first i've I finally felt isolated in three minutes it was lovely but i'm not going to do it again and the uh thanks very much uh, to everyone i'm sure you probably said that anyway but i was also going to say midday on sunday we're doing another science q a uh if you have any questions questions from your kids questions with homework problems uh that you've oh by the way uh james sent in the third kind of plague is septicemic plague so pneumonic bubonic and septicemic plague thank you very much james uh, i'll now go back down and do uh, my son's homework with him 
Uh, but yeah, 12 o'clock on Sunday, midday, uh, we've got Brian Green, uh, Brian Cox and Helen Chersky. Any of your science questions, uh, send them to us uh, in any way you can. There's, we've got uh, an email and we've got you know Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, and we'll ask those at midday. But thank you very much, Steve, and thank you, Les. And uh, thank, you. thank you, Josie. See you guys later.